Good evening, everyone, and welcome to tonight's Nutshell Discussion with Greg Judy. I hope where you're joining us from is warm and you are well. If this is your first Nutshell, welcome. Um, we're happy to have you here, and if you're returning with us, welcome back. My name is Katie Adams, and I'm the Research and Demonstration Farm Manager here at the Savannah Institute. Before we get rolling tonight, um, I'd like to tell you a little bit about who we are and what we do. The Savannah Institute is a nonprofit organization based out of Wisconsin and Illinois, focused on agroforestry research and education. We truly believe that widespread agroforestry can help restore ecosystems, build resilience, and support strong economies of cooperation between farmers, researchers, and perennial industry builders. We do this work through a variety of avenues. We host on-farm field days, which we were uh, very lucky to have a field day with Greg Judy this year. Um, we do online and print resources focused on key agroforestry practices, land access and lease structures, and the basics of establishing tree crops. And these are all available for free on our website. We just released a great new set of key crops for the Midwest info sheets, so go to savannahinstitute.org to check those out. We are also building a network of demonstration farms across central Illinois and southern Wisconsin this year in 2020. Uh, we're growing, so please keep an eye out for position announcements. We would love to have you join our team. I would like to thank our sponsors, the Hegner Family Foundation and North Central SARE. Without their generous support, we would not be able to bring you these nutshell discussions for free. During this evening's discussion, if you're joining us from a computer, I want to invite you all to share your questions and comments in the chat box below. Um, I will monitor them throughout the nutshell and make sure to address them during the Q&A session at the end. If you are joining us by phone, I'll give you instructions on how to ask a question after Greg's presentation. And just for everyone's knowledge, everyone is muted for better sound quality. And if you're joining us by phone, you will be able to ask a question over the phone at the end of the presentation. Okay, so without further ado, now we're on to the main event. We are so honored to welcome our presenter for the evening, Greg Judy of Green Pastures Farm, who is joining us from a very snowy Missouri. Along with his wife, Jan, Greg Judy of Clark, Missouri, runs a grazing operation on over 1,500 acres of leased and owned land. Hol holistic high-density planned grazing is used to graze cow-calf pairs, breed heifers, bulls, and stalkers. They own and run a grass genetic cow herd, hair sheep flock, trained guardian dogs, and raised shiitake mushrooms. They have also began an on-farm sawmill operation to direct market lumber from the timbered areas on their farms. They direct market grass-fed beef, lamb, mushrooms, and lumber. They also market grass genetic bulls and heifers along with parasite-resistant rams and ewe lambs. Greg and Jan also have a ranch internship program that brings young folks onto their ranch to teach them how to manage their own successful grazing operations. And with that, I'll turn it over to Greg to get things started. So give us just one second as we switch presenters. So uh, I've been asked to talk a little bit about our, our marketing, our, and basically marketing your landscape and how we do that. Um, a little background, uh, we've got uh, several farms that we've been leasing over the years, and um, we've built that up now that we have uh, basically 16 farms that we're managing with you know, cattle and sheep and uh, just the mushrooms and the civil pasture and always looking to uh, try and figure out different avenues to market that through. So I'm going to talk a little bit tonight about how we're marketing some of our products and, and some of our successes and failures. And, uh, and one of the things is nobody really knows who you are. And so you've got to put a shingle out there. You've got to hang your shingle up and let people know your story you got to get people onto the farm. Um, otherwise, you know, you might be the best at what you're doing in the world, but if nobody knows you're out there, it's pretty darn tough to, to, to market what you're producing. And, you know, we, we kind of pride ourselves on not producing what everybody else is. We've got a little bit different story, a little bit different angle. Uh, we raise things differently than other people or animals look a little different whatever but if you are doing exactly what everybody else is doing and you're expecting to market your animals or whatever product that you've got and do better than your neighbors you're not going to because you're the same so you've got to figure out 
a niche and that can be a lot of different things and so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things we've done tonight that has helped us um, you know we, again we're talking you know the, the civil pasture is a big it's a big uh, sales tool for our farms uh, this particular farm right here that you're looking at this is when we leased three years ago and it's 120 acres. It was solid timber, except for there was a 20-acre field out here to the left that was open. But the rest of it just choked timber, unmanaged timber. And so we, what we did is we went in and made this civil pasture where the cows are. I don't know. It's probably 100, 200 feet wide. But we did that the full width of the property, all the way around the whole perimeter. And now it looks like a park. And we've got all this beautiful forage down here in the, in the lower canopies. And we still got shelter and shade, and it's just really is a great tool to show other prospective landowners what you can do with unmanaged timber. So we kind of, we're kind of marketing our expertise by producing beautiful landscapes. So you know the people that own this farm, um, we got a ten-year lease on this, and these people came out after we did all this clearing and. We unrolled hay in here, brought the cattle in. Now we've got forages growing in here. And they're like, Greg, it looks like a park. And that's what we want. We, we, we want to have that kind of response. We want it to look different. And it definitely looks a lot different today than it did when we started. Um, here we are. Uh, this We're now hosting some of the uh, Missouri agroforestry classes. Uh, this is uh, one of the foresters giving a talk on how to estimate your timber and your, the density of the trees. I think he actually has a prism there in his hand, Richard, he's holding. And uh, they bring in, you know, 40 to 50 students every year, and our farm is one of the stops. And we enjoy being part of that. And we, we get a lot out of it, too, because we get the expertise of these professors. And we've learned a lot about, you know, timber selection, um, what they call TSI, timber stand improvement and which trees to keep, which ones not to. And we get an added benefit from it. These guys divide this group and these group into three different groups, and they go around our farm, I'm sorry, around the timber, and they mark the trees for us, the ones that need to stay and the ones that need to come out. So that's kind of cool. We get our, our timber marked and done by professionals. And the students get to learn at the same time. So, again, getting people onto your farm, that's, that's just key. Um, this is another farm we leased. This is a 240-acre property. It, uh, it's kind of a neat story. It was actually owned about 50 years ago by my uncle, which was killed. And uh, after he uh, his heirs sold it, I've got it back, leased, which is kind of neat. And uh, so we went in and done a lot of clearing up here on top. Uh, it's a really good wildlife farm. We, we, uh, we sell uh, wildlife hunts. So we're marketing, we like to say we're marketing solar energy through a deer or a turkey. Um, you know, it's people will pay money to come out for a chance to pursue wildlife. And so if you control the land and you make it better and you start opening up some of these canopies and, and getting sunlight down into the forest floor, it's amazing what happens with the wildlife component. Uh, it's just unbelievable. So we're excited about that. Um, the sheep, you know, when you start opening up this canopy now, this, this, from that gravel road, well, you can't see the end of it, but it goes on in there probably another 100, 200 feet. When I opened that up, and you can't really tell what I did, but it was thick. You couldn't walk through there. Couldn't see through it. We probably cut, I don't know, 80% of the trees out of there. When we did, all these sprouts started coming up. And I'm like, oh my gosh, how am I going to control those? Well, there it is. Those sheep are absolutely sprout eaters. And uh, so if you can get sheep, or you know, we prefer sheep because they're a whole lot easier to keep in than goats. But goats, goats are a, a tool you can use as well. They're just a little bit more aggressive to fence in. You've got to have pretty good fence to hold them. There it is. So that's what it looked like before, and this is what it looked like after. You see a little bit of difference there. Um, all the leaves are gone on that sprout. All the sprouts in there are just gone, and 
the sheep did that in one day. One single day. So if you got animals, uh, you know, when you start clearing this brush and it's on some terrain, you may not want to get, uh, you know, machinery down in there. You need animals to, to help you control the unwanted sprouts that are coming up. Because you'll have a ton of them when you open up that sunlight. Um, the pigs, you know, we, we've done the pastured pigs. We bring them through some of our civil pasture areas. And they do well uh, in, the, in the timber. They need to have shade. And uh, those pigs, they were being moved on large areas and moved quickly enough they didn't tear up the farm. And you can see how healthy animals are. I mean, animals don't belong in a barn. I'm sorry. Uh, you, you don't see any mud on those pigs. And they don't stink. They absolutely smell wonderful. And that's the way our animals should look. And that's the way we should market our animals. Uh, we have customer appreciation days. So we have people come out onto the farm and see the things that we're doing on the farm. And these are people that are buying our meat or maybe buying some of our livestock. Uh, it's, it's just key. You know, when people start seeing your management practices where you're managing in sync with nature, that's marketing. That's marketing. And, you know, you don't need every single customer on your farm to buy something. But you don't, you never know, you know, this gentleman right here, he, he may call up uh, next year and he may want a, a you know, grass genetic heifer or some rams. The, the, the key in marketing, I think, is to network. And network as much as you can, and that's just priceless, getting more people knowing who you are. Um, share your story with consumers. These are a couple of young girls. Uh, the middle one's actually a distant cousin of mine, and she'd never had been around chickens. And so I grabbed that chicken up and handed it to her. You can tell she's a little bit freaked out about it, but you know, this lady over here, she's one of our consumers, and you know, so she she'll eat that chicken. But people need to know where their food's coming from, and I think that's extremely important. Um, you know, we do the the multi-species thing here. We, we've got our South Pole bulls running in with the with the uh, sheep and you know, we share that story and uh, this particular video uh, I made a video that's going across the road and put it on my YouTube channel it's crazy I think that thing hit like I don't know eight to ten thousand views people people just uh, they want to see things done differently and so we you know we put the these bulls there are 47 bulls in with about 200 and a sheep and they didn't, the first time you put them in there, the dog, I think that's the dog over there laying down, the dogs kind of chased the bulls around a little bit, and then that was it. it. It happened for five minutes. But see, this sheep is ingesting the parasites from that cow, or that bull. The, this bull is ingesting the parasites that affect the sheep. And so they act as co-species for each other. And that, again, that's part of your marketing. You need to explain to people why you're doing this. and It's different. And it's, it's done so you don't have to worm. You know, we don't worm anything. We don't worm the animal. We don't worm the, the uh, beef animals. We don't worm the sheep. You don't have to if you do good management. Um, this is our wood miser, our sawmill. And uh, we started, we have a ton of trees that were taken out of these civil pasture areas. And what are you going to do with these trees? I mean, there's only so much firewood you can burn. And uh, so you can mill them. And so we've got a, our own mill now where we can mill the lumber. And that's that's been another marketing tool. Um, and we're just getting started in this. There's so many, so much opportunity in this. Uh, just selling slabs, these, these live edge slabs, and looking at possibly building some river tables, they call them. I'm really excited about that. That's going to be a winter project. Um, so you take that. That's a great big live edge piece. It's probably three inches thick. And you can sand that down and you can make tables out of them. Um, people like, people like this, this live edge on the side. Okay, There's a big craze about that. And heck, I like it because that's just one cut I don't have to make you know, with the sawmill. So big slabs, got a lot of heartwood in there. Uh, you sand that up, brings out the, the luster of the grain and you got a pretty good sized chunk of money set right there. Um, this is some of the, uh, the eastern red cedar uh, picnic tables. Um, those, that's all two inch stuff. 
and uh, we call this our theft proof uh, picnic table. That thing weighs about 600 pounds. So there's not going to be somebody come along and just throw it in the back of the pickup. <laughs> you got it setting out in your yard. It's, it's a very heavy duty picnic table, but it's heavy duty. It'll last you forever. These are some of the benches, uh, lawn benches that you can make out of, or again, live edge. People kind of freak out about that. They like that. Uh, we have a lot of farm walks, and these are people that, some of them are farmers, other farmers, and we like sharing what we're doing. There, and there's, a, there's an old saying, and I'm sure all of you all have heard that, and I'll, I'll repeat it again, but the more you give, the more you get back. And so if you're willing to share, willing to share what you're learning and what you're doing with other people, it'll pay you back tenfold. And I think that's been a big a big uh, learning for a lot of people is in this regenerative agriculture, it seems like people are willing to share. And you go out into private business like, you know, a factory or a big conglomerate or something. Everybody's hiding each other's secrets. And nobody wants to share anything. But in the regenerative farming, people are more than willing to share what they're doing. And I think that's really cool. So you should share what you're doing. Get people involved and excited about what you're doing. This has uh, probably been one of the biggest uh, steps in our farming practices is getting our sheep broke to this one single wire. So what this has allowed us to do, uh, there's dogs in there with those sheep. This is the civil pasture area that we've cleared out, a lot of sprouts. But we can control our sheep with one wire, and that's 10 inches off the ground. And... When you can control animals with one 10-inch wire, that opens up a lot of possibilities for you on your farm or other people's farm. I mean, you could go onto a farm where there wasn't even any fence, put in that one wire and electrify it, and by golly, you could run sheep on that farm. Um, if a person's got a bunch of sprouts or brushes taken over, it's a really, it's a really powerful tool. Um, this is some of the wild mushrooms we... That was actually down in the cattle pasture. Um, mataki. That was a really good eating wild mushroom. Um, so grazing for better wildlife. Basically what we're doing is we're taking idle land. It needs pulsed grazing. So we're beating it up with a mob of animals, and then we leave. And when you do that, you stimulate new plants because there's a symbiosis that goes on between ruminant animals and growing plants. They need each other. And when the growing plant doesn't have an animal to graze it, it, it goes decadent, it, it, it gets old, it dies, and the leaves fall over, and it actually shades out the crown of the plant. And the plant will die. It needs an animal on it. Not only is the animal grazing it, it's pooping and peeing on it. Okay? It's, it's trampling litter. It's just a natural symbiosis that's been going on for thousands of years. But it takes management. And, again, that's how we market our farms. And we've got 16 farms. Um, four of those we now own, 12 are leased. But uh, on these leased farms, we're starting to try and get the landlords more involved with their farms and show them what we can do. That was a pair of our interns. They found a really nice rack while we were building fence. That was kind of a nice little surprise. Uh, that was a big one. That one actually died on the farm. Looks like from old age, probably. Um, of course, we're getting more turkeys now, and this is another form of marketing. When you build a, when you get a lease, if you get your hands on a piece of property, this is owned by a school teacher. He didn't ha he didn't have anything going on this farm. He just owned it, and so I offered to build a pond on here for him, and he split the cost. He wanted to put pitch in, and he wanted it bigger, so he built it bigger. It's about an acre. Well, I told him I said I'll stock it and I'll put cedar trees in it for you. Well, we put concrete blocks on those cedars so they can't float around, and now that's his fish habitat. And so the landowner, he got a pond that he can fish in. I've got, we've got a pond that we can water our livestock out of. Of course, there is a pipe right out here in the middle. It's on the bottom of the pond. It goes through that dam, and there's a pipe. There's a tank on the back side. If you go through the expense or if you get on a landowner's farm, don't let your animals in the pond. That's the quickest way there is to lose a lease. Don't do that. Because they're expensive to build, and landowners like to fish, and they don't want to see a, 
cow after swimming around like a hippopotamus, pooping and peeing in his pond. It's going to ruin the fishing. Yeah, so we're marketing fishing opportunities too. Our leases that come out and lease our hunting and fishing rights, they get to fish our ponds. And I get to fish our ponds. I like catching big fish too. Uh, the the silver pasture, there's some of the byproducts, of course. We're, we're into the uh, shiitake mushrooms. Um, you know, you can only sell so much firewood, so we decided we could take these logs, and these are the tops. That's the top section out of the trees. It's not the saw log. It's the, you might say, the sapwood areas. And uh, you, those are the little plugs you put in there. And seven to nine months later, you've got mushrooms coming out. It's pretty cool. We love mushrooms. We love eating mushrooms. Um, so the Columbus method, I tell people, you can't turn them out in the spring and discover them in the fall. We're talking about animals. That just will not work. You've got to use management. And uh, the landowners, they can recognize good management. This is a lease farm. This is some savanna grazing. That ditch you're looking at here, all down in here, you couldn't see through that. We left the oak and the walnut and took out the junk trees the ash and some of the cedar and uh, the elm. A lot of the trees were just weren't very healthy. But the animals, we put the animals in there very high stock and density and left them there just for like three or four hours. We've done that multiple times, and now we've got forage growing in there. It's beautiful. This is the driveway. This is the, the, the wealthy doctor's entrance coming into his farm. It used to look like, you know, it looked awful, but now it's just this beautiful park. As he walks, as he drives in his farm, he likes that. So wildlife, it's a sign of balance. Every species of wildlife supports eight, an additional eight species. So you, if you think about marketing, you're trying to, to get more species onto your farm. Well, you know, people, I, I put a video out the other day on a rabbitat, and uh, basically a rabbitat is you build a brush pile, you put tin in the bottom of it to keep the, the rain off the rabbits. You put three big logs down, you put your tin, and you build a big brush pile on top of it. And the rabbits and the, and the, and the mice, and it, I, I'm sure there's an occasional snake in there too, but you're building habitat for the rabbits, and you have more rabbits if you give them a place to live. Well, what's rabbits got to do with making a living on the farm? Well, first of all, if you provide rabbits... Maybe the coyotes and the foxes won't kill your baby lambs. Or the hawks. The hawks won't carry off the chickens as many as much if you give them some rabbits. So it's all, it, everything goes together. And the more species, and I'm serious about this, the more species that you can build, to bring onto your farm, your farm will be more profitable at the end of the day. That's what, you know, I used to wake up in the morning, folks, and I had this, crazy thought, what can I kill today? Whether it was an autumn olive tree or some invasive brush was trying to put us out of business. I was just trying to kill everything. And finally, I, and you know, the aha moment is like, you're not going to win this war. It's not a war. If you learn to work with nature and, and look for marketing opportunities in even the invasive species that live on your farm, there is there's a profit potential there. Don't kill the stuff. Find a way to make money with it. And uh, we've done some of that. So there's an archery lease, you know, marketed solar energy through that deer. And because of our grazing, our practices, we're getting better deer now. Our, our landowner hunters, we've got some of those. Uh, four of our farms are owned by landowners. I'm sorry. Four of our landowner farms are owned by hunters. And so we treat those a little differently. Uh, we graze off their plots next to the deer stands, typically 30 to 60 days before season opens, and we, we remove livestock from those hunting areas. So we need to we mark that down on our grazing chart so we don't have the livestock in the way of hunting season. You just can't do that. You will, you will not keep that lease if you do that. Of course, there's some of our deer hunter landowners. Uh, this is some of the things we just kind of play around with this is a hugel bed. We can grow food on wood. That's the hugel bed, so we just buried it. And uh, that big stump is now growing food. Uh, timber management, we're really big into that. I like to take stuff like this. This is another farm we got. 
just full of honey locusts. Those are the ones that have the thorns on them. Now, not all honey locusts have thorns on them. And this particular one right here is a thornless honey locust tree. And so what I did is I, I marked the very best one in there. I think it was that center one. And I did that. So I took out the other two and left the best one. And uh, when you take out the other two, of course, as bad as I don't like uh, brush killer, if you don't paint those two stumps, the two that I cut, you're going to have a billion sprouts coming up. And those are the bad ones. They really get mad when you cut them. So there's a place. I mean, I don't like it, but it is a tool. It's a new toolbox you can use. Let me bring in some of the pigs in some of these areas. Uh, after the pigs come in the cover crop, this is a nine-way species we just broadcast. So you don't work up the ground, just let the pigs do it. And it makes a beautiful seed bed, uh, just spreading it. I just did it, the cyclone cedar, one of those you carry on your stomach. And there's nine different beautiful cover crops coming up in that canopy there. Uh, we, we walk our animals. Uh, we don't haul them. Uh, hauling animals is very stressful, and it costs a lot of money, a lot of fossil fuel. And uh, we feel like animals have four legs. They can walk. And so we do these cattle drives up and down these rural country roads, and it works quite well as long as you do it at 9 o'clock in the morning everybody's at work. Uh, this is one of our practices. A lot of the farms that we get, folks, are farms that nobody wanted. That's because they were overgrown with cedars. There wasn't a lot of grass on them. There wasn't any fence, maybe not any water. But this is all marketing. If you can take a farm like this and turn it around, and you can show other people before and after pictures, bring them on there and show them what you're doing. Folks, land. Land is the most expensive part of farming. If you can take that little... Uh, gizmo out, not having to buy it, but just where you can manage it. It really gives you a lot of opportunities uh, in your marketing program where you can, you know, you're selling yourself. That's what you do. We're in the landscape beautification business. That's what we do. We take a, a degraded landscape and we turn it in to something that is beautiful. And we do that in two to three years with the animals and some hard work. Um, here's some coppice autumn olive. Before, I would have cut those off right down here at the ground, and I'd have painted them with brush killer, that darn thing. But you know what? That produces a ton of food. I don't paint them anymore. I let them grow back. That's what they do. And they'll do that in about 60 days in the growing season. Look at all the food on there. Sheep will harvest every one of those leaves. And what's that plant doing? It's putting out root exudates. It's healing the soil. And, and dummy me that used to want to kill everything, I was painting brush killer on the stumps and killing the roots that were healing the soil. So we, we really can get this straight linear thinking and it goes against us pretty bad. So we need to get rid of that. Figure it. You know, not only are the sheep going to eat that, the deer and the cattle too. So it's food. It's food for your livestock. Um, when we go into an area, this had a lot of eastern red cedar on it. We keep the deciduous trees. This is a, a really nice oak. It's about 20 feet tall now. That was taken five years ago. Uh, it's big enough now. It's throwing out shade, and a lot of acorns are starting to fall on the ground. So it feeds the deer and the turkey and the cows. Uh, today, we had a snowstorm in Missouri. The cows were, were down in these trees. Guess what they were eating? Those cows, all their noses were covered in snow, and they were chowing down on just nice, ripe acorns and doing a 100 on them. It's the green acorns that fall off right in the early fall. Those are the ones that are toxic, especially to young animals. And so we don't, we don't let the animals down in the woods when they first fall off. But once that acorn turns brown, tremendous good forage. It's a good mass crop for your animals, especially deer and turkey. Uh, this is a, uh, a little experiment we did. I used a no-till no drill and just drilled a uh, cover crop right into my fescue pastures, and that was done in July. And that crop never got a rain on it. Now, the ground was moist. It was almost too moist when I drilled it. But you can see our soils 
uh, are doing quite well to produce that kind of cover crop with no fertilizer. That just grew out of the pasture. Here's some of the civil pasture area where we've done the shiitakes. Uh, we took out some market uh, logs, and you see the logs stacked up here. Those will all be inoc those are going to be inoculated. Um, we always do the the mushroom prep in the fall. In winter time, it's a, more of a slow time for us, and it's a good winter exercise. Those are perfect size. You don't want them too big. You don't want them too small. The smaller they are, like well, there's not a real small one in there. Maybe that one. The smaller they are, the, they don't last as long. The perfect shiitake log is about four to six inches right there. That's just a beautiful, it's easy to handle. It'll last a long time. We do use oak. We have a lot of oak. And oak lasts the longest. In other words, it won't rot away in two years. There's a mixture of firewood cutting along plus shiitake. Uh, we do sell uh, firewood. That's another another uh, thing to do. Um, that's a gate that one of our interns built. He was a blacksmith and a pretty darn good one at that. Here we are in the, in the shop in the winter time. It's, it is pretty chilly. Uh, we don't like building a fire. It, it, we have a fireplace in there, but it's kind of nice to work when it's cool in the winter time. You, you don't get a sweat going and having a good time. They're putting the, the spawn in. Uh, there they are. They're, they're actually uh, kicking out mushrooms now. And uh, that first year, I only did 40 logs, and uh, we've ramped that up now. I think we're up to 2,000. And every winter, I try and do two to 300. So once you get your pipeline full, if you'll do like a couple hundred. Well, that's what we're doing. I'm not saying you need to do that, but if you're going to market mushrooms, you got to keep fresh ones coming on. So you'll always have a, a supply of mushrooms. Uh, we do sell to uh, health food stores in Columbia. Uh, restaurants um, and a few uh, uh, grocery stores. Um, these are uh, different kind of mushrooms. Um, there's uh, some dove. This is the uh, oyster mushrooms. And boy, I can't remember the name of those. My brother grew those. They look like something you see in outer space, but oh, it's right on the tip of my tongue. Those. Those right there are really good for you. Though you make you boil it, you make like a tea out of it. It's supposed to fight off Alzheimer's and all kinds of stuff. Pretty cool looking mushroom. Uh, those are some shiitakes. Uh, they absolutely went nuts that day. <laughs> There's a ton of shiitakes there. Uh, those are oyster oyster mushrooms growing in. Uh, this is a straw bag, so you sterilize the straw and you put your your spawn in there and the uh, mushroom, then you make a few holes in the bag, and that's what comes out of the holes. Uh, this is our typical uh, farm prep. We get an old farm. You can see what's out there. That's broom sedge. That's nasty, bankrupt, what you see, bankrupt soil grass. But guess what we're doing? We're bringing in the carbon, and this is our little bale and roller. It goes on ATV, and that's how we build our soils that we have something to market off these bankrupt farms. Folks, you can't, that's what I think is a, a kind of travesty about people talking about sustainable, unsustainable. Well, if you're sustainable and you're sustaining a, a degraded uh, land uh, resource, in other words, you've got an old broke farm, you're sustaining it, there's nothing important about that. You want to be regenerative, so you're building soil. That's what we're, we're looking at. There it is. It's rolling it out. Uh, there's a honey locust savanna that we we uh, have on our farm. We didn't cut the honey locust. We're we're using that to grow grass. There's the animals working for us. They're breaking down the thatch. This is a newly leased farm. There hadn't been animals on that farm for 70 years, and the animals had really opened up that canopy. And then we can go in with our chainsaws and we can kind of see what we're doing. There they are. Look at that. Isn't that beautiful? So this, this is our grazing line, and we had a, a wire in there. There it is, and they got through tramping it on the ground. They actually shaded it up, and there are about 300 of them dead. And we don't come back until it looks like that again. So we want landscapes where you have uh, shelter, you have food, the mass crops, the wildlife, and the animal, the domestic animals. It's, 
it all works in symbiosis. This is a great little tool that we used early on. Uh, we take this to drag these to our sawmill. We do have a tractor now, but that thing there works on an ATV. You can drag an 800-pound log to your mill or to sell or whatever. That wheel starts down here. And as you take, pull forward, the wheel rides up. And when it does, it lifts the log up that you put the, the log chain around. It really works good. A summary. We need to manage our trees for food and shade, lumber and shelter. And I talked a little bit about, you know, you got to dare to be different. If, you, if you're not different from what your neighbors are doing on the farm, don't expect to get a different result. And you really got to set yourself apart, whether it's, um, you know, if everybody's raising black cattle, well, then don't raise black cattle, raise red ones. If everybody's growing shiitakes, well, then maybe grow moistures. Or, but at the bottom, at the end of the day, it's got to be something that's unique to, and you need to have a story from your heart. People uh, will buy your story if it's from your heart. They're, 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 they're buying your dreams. They're, they're, they're buying what's happening, what you're doing to the land, healing it. And, um, you know, what's really made a big difference in, in our, just in the last year, um, well, first of all, I wrote a book in 2001, and that helped a lot get our name on the, you might say, on the map, and people started calling me about, you know, the way we're leasing land and custom grazing other people's cattle, and we, we did. We, we, we picked up a lot of tips on that, and then uh, came back with my second book in 2008, Comeback Farms, and uh, that was a, just kind of going on from where I started on the other one. Uh, talking more about the mob grazing and the multi-species grazing and stuff like that. And um, then from there, just this last year, I got into my own channel of YouTube, and that's been really good. We started out with 200 subscribers, and I think I'm up to uh, 17,000 now. And um, so it's it's been good. Uh, we It's allowed us to market just about everything we sell. And people, when you tell a story, I think it needs to be genuine. I don't think I know it has to be genuine. Don't, you know, be yourself. Um, be honest with people. If you sell them something, stand behind it. And, you know, raise the very best that you can raise. Don't sell somebody something that you wouldn't want to put on your farm. Um, that's just good business, okay? If you start selling inferior animals or inferior produce or whatever, it's going to get around. And people are going to... It's a lot easier to ruin market than it is to, to, to create a market. Because bad news travels faster than good news. So don't just don't do that. Um, your reputation is just as good as what you say it is. And I think that's important. Um, so with that, and this is a this is a good story. This is our lifetime lease's son, and now his kids are getting old enough. There won't be too many years they're going to be coming up, and so we've got three potentially three generations now of our lifetime lease. Now, some of y'all may not have heard of that, but we we actually do. We have a lifetime lease, and uh, the the people ripped up my contract after the first year. I hadn't signed a ten year lease, and the landlords ripped it up and said your lease isn't any good. I'm like, what do you mean it's not any good? And they said, well, we, we've talked it over. Greg, you've done so much work. We love what you're doing. We're going to give you a lifetime lease. And so they put it in the will. And uh, their kids can't sell the farm until I'm dead. And that's pretty powerful. And you get that kind of, uh, you know, respect from the landlord. They just, they don't, they don't want to lose us. They absolutely don't want to lose our management because have what we've done to their farms. And so I think there's opportunities out there, and it's all about marketing yourself and your products and making sure that you have a story, and not just a story, a real story. You know, what are you doing with the land? Is the land getting better under your management? How about the, the, the wildlife out there? Uh, is, is, the, is your farm sharp looking? There's no trash laying around. There's no old equipment. The building's in disrepair. You are a, uh, your farm is a mirror image of you. 
And so if you have a junky looking farm, don't expect to go out and get a lease. They're, you're not going to get a lease. Not because people see that and like, well, I don't want that person taking care of my farm. So you really got to, um, you might say, be nitpicky if you want to get a piece of land for free. And that's what this is. This is a free lifetime lease. So, yeah, they're, they're out there. There's opportunities. We have several free leases. We don't pay our landlords anything. It's our management services. It's marketing, folks. That's what we're doing, we're marketing ourselves and our services. And I think that was the end of that. And uh, I think I'm on about right to you, Katie. I think I was supposed to go about 45 minutes. Can you yeah, unmute everybody? Yep, yeah, that's perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Greg, for that really both informative and inspiring presentation. You know, I, I really love the way that you tied in how marketing is a part of your story and it's a big part of what you do on the land. So it's all tied together and not something that's separate on the outside of it. Right, right. So folks, if you have questions and you're joining us by computer, um, feel free to drop it here in the chat box and then I'll read your question to Greg and that way we're not having so much uh, noise interference. Um, one, one question that I have why folks are typing their, their questions in is I work with a lot of first generation farmers and uh, folks that don't come from a lot of farming backgrounds. Um, would, what kind of advice would you have for, for those people that, you know, don't have a lot of strong networks yet, um, maybe where they're starting to farm or within farming communities? Yeah. Um if you're just starting out, you don't have a lot of experience, but you're one, you you have a passion for it. It's something that you're really interested in. You love love to get your feet wet. My my uh, advice would be to try and find somebody that is the best in the field that you can find, and go to go to uh, you know volunteer for those people. Uh, try and you know pick their brain. Go to work for them. In, you know, if they do internships, do everything you can to, if nothing else, maybe work, work out, you know, if they have a project that they need some help with. But you've got to get, you've got to get your hands in there. And if you don't have access to somebody that's doing what you're doing, it's a pretty tough way to learn, you know, just to go out there and do it. And you don't know what you're doing. So I, my, I guess the final answer to that, Katie, would be that an internship is, is pretty priceless for young people. And, um, yeah, that's what I would do. I'm glad you brought that up about working with other folks that that know more than you do <laughs> and learning from them. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, that's crucial. Josiah asked, uh, he says, thanks for the presentation and has the question, how do you expand? Do you get the people you need first or get the idea going and then find the people? Well, before you can expand, you, I think you need to have a pilot, uh, a pilot farm, something that is a, a good sales tool to show other prospective landowners what you can do with your management. That might be, uh, you know, pastured chickens, or it could be uh, goats. Heck, it could be a mushroom operation, or you know, whatever your niche is, be good at it. And whatever that niche is. It should be what you really, really love and like to do. So if you really, 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 really like fishing, maybe it's uh, raising fish. Or if you're really good at cattle, maybe it's raising grass-fed beef or whatever. But I think you've got to have uh, uh, a little something going on to show people what you can do. That's going to help you a lot to expand. And that's, you know, when I started out, I started custom grazing other people's cattle. I didn't have any money. I couldn't buy any cattle. I just got through with a six-year divorce and lost pretty much everything I had. And so I started leasing other people's land, and I didn't have the money to put any livestock on it. And so I started getting paid so much a cow per month to run other people's livestock on, on other people's land. And... That really took off once I got going. So if you're good at your craft, you know, go to grazing school. You can go to grazing schools uh, and, and pick up on how to be a better grazer. 
there's a ton of stuff online um, you know the to learn more about grazing if that's what you want to be Nicholas asks would the Missouri agroforestry be a good resource to bring in to a potential lease farm that is heavily timbered? The owner is interested in having me manage it into silvo pasture. Yes, I think there, that would be a, a really valuable uh, resource to use. Also, your, your local NRCS, uh, the local NRCS offices uh, here in Missouri, I know the one in Columbia, they have a, they have a Missouri Department of Conservation forester in there. That's free. I mean, he'll come out and walk your timber with you and give you ideas how to make it better. Mark, I think they even mark the timber for you. You know, the ones that need to be cut out and stuff like that. So, yeah, use those programs. Um, the Missouri Agroforestry, their university, that's one of the premier ones in the nation, and I didn't even know it. <laughs> so, yeah, oh, there's some good guys down there. Michael, Michael Gold and... Um, Gregory Gregory Ormsby, they have the research station out at New Franklin. They're pretty neat just going out and looking what they're doing out there at the research station. I'll also put a quick plug in for Missouri Agroforestry folks. They run a really amazing agroforestry school during the summertime. So yes, check out their website. They do. Okay, I'm going to open it up to the folks that are joining us by the phone. Um, you'll hear instructions on how to ask a question. Um, but if you're calling by phone, you're going to press star six, and that will put you in a queue, and then I'll be able to um, select you to ask your question. So give me one second, and I'm going to switch it over to the phone Q&A. Go ahead. Hello, this is Josiah. I had another question. Um, I'm interested in, in trying some uh, silver pasture type things. I'm here in South Texas. Um, and so our version of silver pastures and mesquite trees and leaf ash and I mean it's kind of rough stuff. Um, do you have any thoughts on, you know, on brush clearing? You know, kind of the same principles but um, different species. Um, how many? You know, do you, do you want that kind of park look? Um, in a, in a different setting, or do you think that would be specific to the uh, fescue walnut uh, situation that you have in Missouri? Or um, yeah, I just kind of want to think, wanted to hear if you thought this this could work in a semi-arid environment like we have down here. So yeah, with the uh, the mesquite, you know, you still got the the brush, which is the cover for your wildlife. It's shelter shelter for your animals. Um, yeah, I, if you open that up, we're sitting, in other words, if you just have a, a thick stand of mesquite, there's not a whole lot going on down in there. It's, it's, it's sealed out the ground. Your sunlight's not getting to the ground, so you're not growing much much forage under there. So you do have to open that up some. And there's a guy up by Bowie, Texas, uh, Jerry, oh, Jerry Devine, I think his last name is. And he's got a lot of mesquite, and he's put his mob into it. And just mobbing it, now he's been doing that in about 15 years, the, the mob of cows are actually starting to take out the mesquite. He's changing the biology of the soil just the way he grazes it. And so he's, he's getting better, better grazing, uh, better wildlife, just by grazing it differently. So, yeah, I think there's, there's some advantages there that you can sure take, take care of. Thank you so much. Any last questions before we wrap up this evening? Well, Greg, I, I want to thank you so much for continuing to, to always share what you learned with others to help build this regenerative farming movement. We're, we're thankful for you, and uh, thank you for joining us tonight. Okay, well, thank you, Katie, and it's always a pleasure. And make sure to check out Greg's YouTube channel, and he also has a really great website. And if you enjoy these Nutshell webinars, please be sure to fill out the evaluation at the end. Um, we'll put up an edited version of this video on YouTube um, here next week, and we hope that you'll join us for the winter 2020 Nutshell season.
that will kick off on January 14th. So thank you for everyone for joining and sharing your great questions. And uh, go out there and be the best that you can be. Thanks so much. Thank, thank you, Katie. Yeah, thank you. Have a wonderful night. Okay, you too.